I always say to my trainees that the best doctors, the best health professionals are people who, when a, a patient or a family come in, the first thing they see is a person in a context, in an environment. And then they start to think about their needs rather than somebody who sees a diagnosis or who seeks a diagnosis. And I think TSC really illustrates to us why it's important that we have a that we start with you as an individual, as a person. I agree with you, mums are always right. <laughs> There's no exception. Um, so, you know, you teach us these fundamentally important things that we all need to remember. So thank you. Thank you for that. Now, the, and as I've said, most people can have different kinds of combinations of these manifestations. And even that was a bit overwhelming. If we try to group it, but it's still a little bit difficult for people. And that's why we developed the TAN checklist as a way for people to try and ask all those questions. Interestingly, the first section on it asks about reading, uh, sitting, walking, talking. So if you start to fill it in from early on, you have a record of these early developmental milestones too. That's why we're trying to get people to do it from, from very early on. Because um, nobody remembers. And then I talked to you about how we tried with our research to say, can we find little groups, natural clusters of TAN manifestations? And we found seven clusters. One is the scholastic cluster, the overactive impulsive cluster, the mood cluster, the aggression and temper tantrum, and I'll say a bit about that in a minute, cluster, the eating sleeping cluster, the neuropsychological, and then the big autism or autism related cluster. Um, and so what we're trying to do is to, is to encourage mums and dads and clinicians to say, let's see if we can use the cluster approach to identify challenges and then to think what can we do next. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to show you, mm -hmm. how many of you have physically seen a TAN checklist? I'm sorry, we should have thought earlier to print some out so you could have them physically here. So it, it's, it's not complicated, it's just literally four pages or like if you think of an A3 folded over, it's like one little piece of paper, and we go through different boxes. And so what I'm gonna do now is, I will use some of these as examples, and then I will ask, I will say what we typically do for intervention, and then I want you to tell me what you've done or what's worked and hasn't worked um, in your setting. Um, so we'll talk a bit about the scholastic cluster, um, but only a little because somebody <coughs> will talk much more about that in a minute. We'll talk a bit about hyperactivity and impulsivity, a bit about dysregulated behaviors, a bit about mood, and a bit about the ASD one. Uh, so let's start with the scholastic one. So if you look, if you, if you had a, a TAN checklist in front of you, you would see item six asks about many people with TSE who are of school age will have difficulty in school. Has your child, or do they either now or did they in the past have difficulty with reading, writing, spelling, maths? And so, any of these would be a marker of the need to think about what might be problematic in school. And as you've seen, almost 60%, two thirds of people with TSC have or have had some of these difficulties. Exactly as you've just heard, exactly. And even when um, their intelligence might be absolutely fine, that makes sense. So let's move on to another one, which I'm sure many of you will have experienced, which is hyperactivity impulsivity. So if on the 10 checklist, you have ticked that you or your child has overactivity, hyperactivity, such as being constantly on the go, fidgety, wriggling, squirming, not being able to wait, butting in, not waiting turn, kind of having to talk all the time. Those are the three items in the impulse, overactivity, impulsivity cluster. Anyone with a child or who has it themselves, this cluster? And not everybody has it. I think I probably have some of it. Um, and why this is an important cluster is because hyperactivity and positivity is a risk marker for lots of other challenges. So when a child is more overactive or impulsive, there are many other things that might become problematic in a school setting, in a social setting, etc. Um, and even when it doesn't meet criteria for ADHD, it might be important for us to think, what can I do to help my child be less overactive or less impulsive than, than they are at the moment? Um, so from a very practical point of view, when people tick, when you, when you or your child has this cluster, we're saying, think about the possibility of ADHD as a diagnosis. So that's that psychiatric diagnosis. Seek appropriate support to consider a diagnosis of ADHD. Um, 
people don't even think to diagnose ADHD. So have a child, and there should be <coughs> pathways, and you can tell me about that, to assess a child for ADHD. And if it's mild to moderate, there are all sorts of educational and other kind of OT-based and other things to help kids focus, in, increase their, their, their um, impulsivity, reduce dysregulated or overactive behaviors. And if it's severe, then we would say use exactly the kind of treatment guidelines that we would for any child outside TSC who has severe ADHD, which is to give them behavioral support and to treat them with stimulant medications. Um, how many of you are scared of stimulant medications like Ritalin or Methylphenidate or Concerta? Anybody heard, know about those sorts of things? Many people are scared of it. Anyone scared of it here? Um, so, and in TSC, many people are worried that stimulants like Ritalin or Methylphenidate can make kids more likely to have seizures because that's a story that we often hear. But the evidence actually doesn't support that. So if, you, if your child or you have significant attention problems that meets criteria of ADHD, stimulant medications can be incredibly helpful to people and it can really help them to access learning. Because if you're all over the place and you're overactive and impulsive, you can't, you can't stop long enough to learn, to let information come in. And that's what those kind of medications can do to people. We know if you have intellectual disability, you're much more likely to have ADHD. You're about 30 times more likely to have autism, but you're probably about five times more likely to have ADHD as well. So that's what we call diagnostic overshadowing. People say they see the TSC or they see the intellectual disability, and they don't think that there might be other treatable conditions. And so that's the message for us, both for families to seek that assessment and for doctors to think about doing the assessment um, and the intervention. And it can be very helpful um, to kids to, to treat appropriately. Um, let's talk a bit about the dysregulated behavior one. And here, the examples that we give are aggressive outbursts and temper tantrums. And just to link to what Rachel said, the term um, meltdowns is very much a term used in the autism community. Um, and I don't mind what you call it, but if you have a child who has tantrums, aggressive outbursts, meltdowns, they become dysregulated and impossible and they start to either hurt themselves or others or shout or scream or kick or break, then we're worried. And this is something that's, uh, that's concerning to many people in TSC. And very interestingly, the rates of aggression are similar whether you have an IQ of 150 or an IQ in the intellectually disabled range. All people with TSC have higher likelihood of aggression. Isn't that interesting? Um, an interest, and some people you know, think that it's, it's about psychological stuff, but actually, do you remember our friends, the mice with tuberous sclerosis? TSC mice are more aggressive than non-TSC mice too. So this, I think there's something in the biology of TSC that predisposes people to aggressiveness. It's the same for anxiety, and I'll come on to anxiety as well um, in a minute. So if either of those are there, then we, we know that we have a child who's, who has difficulties in the dysregulated cluster, or an adult with difficulties in the dysregulated cluster. Um, and we need to think what we can do to manage it. Now, the most common question that I get when doctors refer kids with TSC to me or adults with TSC is, what medication will help for this behavior? Have any of you guys had that question? I'm sure you get it all the time. Um, what do you think is my answer? I say to them, you are asking me the wrong question. Because the question you should ask me is, what is the meaning or the function of that behavior. So, so these are just some examples, and I just wrote some of them down. So if somebody presents with a dysregulated behavior, like aggression or self-injury or a meltdown, we need to think, is it about their inability to communicate? Maybe they're trying to communicate, they don't have enough words, or they have the words, but they can't get them out at the right time. Might that be the, the, the reason, the function, the motivation? Is it about the repetitive stuff that now I'm disrupting it exactly as you've said? And that leads to the to the output. Is is some of these, particularly when it's like self-harming, is it actually an anxiety reducing or a soothing? Sometimes when people hit themselves, it's actually a soothing thing rather than 
anything else. So that's a different kind of function um, to that particular behavior. Is it driven by impulsivity or hyperactivity? Do you remember I've just spoken about hyperactivity and impulsivity? When you're impulsive and a frustrating thought comes into your head, you're much more likely to respond to that, right? So you don't have the brakes to process it before it comes out. So that's how the hyperactivity and impulsivity drives um, these kind of dysregulated behaviors. Um, sensory driven, excellent. Um, and the interesting thing about sensory stuff are there can be obvious sensory stimuli, such as a loud noise, your fire thing this morning, both of us struggled with the fire thing this morning. Um, so predictable things, you know, loud noises, bangs, fireworks, cars, sirens, etc. Um, and those are just undue sensitivity to typical noises. And we see that a lot in people with autism and in many people with TSC. But particularly when you have TSC and autism, there's another unusual kind of sensory sensitivity. And we call that idiosyncratic response to specific sensory stimuli. That's a mouthful. Um, and, but let me think of an example. So that is when there are particular, and you know if you're a mum or a dad who's experienced it, there are particular things that lead to a response. So in, in, in the case of kids with autism, let me think of some examples. So I had a girl in the clinic. Do you know the sound a bus door makes when it opens? That <laughs> sound. That was her trigger. Um, I had many kids in the clinic who, and adults too, who kind of explosive sounds like a dog barking or <coughs> a cough sound um, that's a trigger for some people. And what, what happens with a typical sensory sensitivity is it makes people anxious, so they withdraw. If they hear the alarm, they might put their hands over their ears and run away. Idiosyncratic um, sensory stimuli usually lead to an acute onset of aggression. So the story of one of our, one of our kids, <coughs> autism, intellectual disability, um, but functioning well enough that he could shower independently, and one day he was in the shower, and then when his mum went in, suddenly there was a broken window and his hand was bleeding. And there was this big drama about what was going on and how rude he was and how inappropriate it was for him to break the window. And when they finally rewound the whole story, he was in the shower, heard with his amazing hearing a dog barking somewhere, probably five blocks down, and his response was kind of a hitting out, like that kind of response. And by chance, he broke the window, which then cut his hand. So you can see how we would think completely differently about how to manage that sort of challenge than many of the other kinds of sensory um, or um, challenges associated with these um, dysregulated behaviors. Mood, if you're anxious, and we don't often think about it, anxiety can manifest as aggression particularly in younger children who don't know how to differentiate. It can be fear rather than anything actually aggressive that looks like that. We can come back to this one, attention-seeking. I'm very worried when people say, oh, this child is just attention-seeking. In TSC, it's very rarely the case. Um, because what do we do when kids are attention-seeking? We ignore them. <laughs> how many of you have been told by people, just ignore the behavior? <laughs> It'll go away. Just ignore it for long enough. What do you mean? 20 years? Um, so ignoring is the right intervention if it is to get attention in an inappropriate way. But there are many people, people with angel number, for instance, they have a desire for, they have a, kind of a, a driven desire for eye contact with people. If they don't get it, they really see it because they need it. Um, so then it's not an inappropriate naughty behavior. It's something that's driven much more um, biologically. So, I rarely think that children and adults with TSC who are aggressive or dysregulated are attention seeking. So please don't use that one early on in your differential thinking. Um, because what we do see often is people often do a behavior because they want to escape a demand. Yeah? I make you do something, you have a big outburst, and I send you to your room. Right? Now, if your job was to get out of doing this thing, You've been successful, and I've just reinforced it. Because next time, you know exactly what to do to get out of this job. And so you can see why ignoring something, when actually you're trying to escape maybe doing that thing, can be a competing uh, kind of activity. And then you heard from Claire, pain and discomfort, and in TSC, 
There are so many reasons why people with TSC might have pain or discomfort. Seizures can make you feel uncomfortable. Kidney lesions can make you feel uncomfortable. Your skin can do it. The medications can do it. Your, you know, so many things. And we often forget to think about pain. And we're not going to treat pain with anti-anxiety medications or with behavioral therapies or with sensory stuff, right? We're going to treat it with painkillers or with treating the infection or whatever it is. So this is really just a, a very simplistic way of showing that when we see dysregulated behaviors, we need to think through a range of possibilities. There may be many more, a little bit. Um, so, <clears throat> once we understand sort of the driver of the dysregulated behavior, we can now say, okay, maybe I need to work on communication. Maybe I need to work on pain. Maybe I need to work on the sensory things. Maybe I need to work on whatever it is. But at the core of that, we still want to find ways of helping you, and we all get dysregulated, let's face it, um, to, to help you or your family member to self-regulate. Two-year-olds, you talked about two-year-olds, are the most violent creatures in the world, right? Yeah? Imagine you were as aggressive at the age of 22 as you were when you were two. So we unlearn aggression in a way. We're all dysregulated and then we become more regulated. So we can all and should all be given tools to try and become regulated. So I loved how Claire talked about external strategies to try and measure where am I with my thermometer, one, two, three, four, five, or whatever works for, for people. And then to try and think, okay, what can I do? Or what can you do? How can we think together about what you can do when you get to the yellow, when you get to the, the orange, or when you get, before you get to the red? Because when you get to the red, we can't do anything at all. Um, and that, when we get to the red, that's when we need these amazing facilities, like the lady from the N, um, uh, okay. NAS was talking about. But the, in the ideal world, we don't want to have to depend on amazing facilities to help people regulate themselves. Because we can't drop everything and drive over 20 miles so that somebody can go into a sensory room. We want to use that as a way to help them learn how they can build those kind of regulation tools into their own daily routine. It's much harder for people who, are, who have more significant intellectual and developmental disabilities, but everyone can learn some of these principles. So, which of, who of you have tricks or techniques that you've used at home to help your kids come down, or your family members just kind of come back to regulating themselves a little bit, or do some relaxation, or any of these kind of things? Who have tricks? You've already had some tricks from. <laughs> A cup of coffee or a little freely? Yes, you see. Well, when, when, when you're British, a cup of tea always helps with that thing. That just kind of, let's just sit down and just, that's the way, that's a, that's a self-regulation strategy. We don't think about it, we put on the kettle and we just calm down. That's self-regulation, right? We do that. Um, or you might go and sit in your room or you might just go and have a cry on your bed. That's self-regulation. We all do it. We all need to find ways of, of doing it. I usually go into the loo and just sit on the toilet and people think I'm constipated. <laughs> so we all have those techniques, but sometimes we have to be more overt. And sometimes people are worried, can I, can I teach somebody who has intellectual disability to self-regulate? Or can I teach a young child to do you know, deep breathing or relaxation? With one of my clinical psychologists in the clinic that was, she was trying to find a very visual way to help kids do belly breathing or balloon breathing. America, I went, met a mom who calls it ninja breathing. I'm not oh. sure how ninjas breathe, but anyway. <laughs> and so Jill, our psychologist, got the kids, and she does exclusively work with children, to each find a nice flat pebble. And then she makes them lie down and put the stone on their tummy. So they call it stone breathing. And then in your breathing, you need to try and make the stone go up. See how it goes it's down. It's that again, so we would use it with them. So it's just a bit. Five or ten days. And what I like about that is it's, you can carry a stone <laughs> with you. It's easy. You don't need specialized equipment. And once you can do it lying down, you can learn to do it standing up. And then it just becomes the thought of the stone. And I think that's cool. That's a really beautiful one. And breathing, breathing um, lying down is lovely because you're not thinking, you know, but you're not thinking about your posture. That's different for us as, as adults yeah. to sit and think about that. But when, children, when you're lying down, you're fully relaxed. Yeah. So, so you're not worried a, about that's a lovely am example. I sitting up straight? Another very, I think, visual nice thing that Jill does is 
She gets little containers that she fills with glycerin that you can buy in the pharmacy and glitter. You know normal glitter? And so, and then seals it very, very carefully. And then when kids are starting to feel aggressive or restless, she gets them to shake this thing. Show me how you're feeling. And then you look at this thing and watch the glitter fall down. You can see another very visual strategy just to, to help with that self-regulation. And it's something, again, you can carry in your pocket. Um, it's not a expensive or a specialized bit. Th these are the ideas. I mean, we don't want you to all to rush out and get stones and, 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 and glitter things, but it's illustrations of things that are within our reach that we can do that we can try and build into the routines of children and people with TSC that might then help them with this self-regulation issue. We've spent far too long on this, but this is a major challenge for so many people. Um, mood and anxiety. So if you've ticked anxiety, depressed mood, extreme shyness, mood swings, those are all in the mood anxiety cluster. And in fact, even people with severe to profound intellectual disability can have mood and anxiety disorders. We often don't think about it, back to the diagnostic overshadowing. But if somebody with significant intellectual disability has a change in their behavior, they're no longer interested in the things they used to be interested in, there's a sudden change in their sleep, they're eating, etc. Those might all be markers of an anxiety or a mood disorder as well. And then we need to think about it and do an appropriate investigation um, and then do some work. If it's mild to moderate, there are all sorts of self-help and talking treatments that we can use um, for people. And if it's severe, we, it would be entirely appropriate to add something like an SSRI, which is the standard um, medication treatment for mood or anxiety disorders. They work in people with TSC. The reason people have anxiety and mood disorders is because people don't think about them. As I've said before, people miss thinking about anxiety. And they say, oh, you're anxious because you have TSC. You're anxious because you have kidney lesions. You're anxious because you have epilepsy, rather than you may have anxiety. I had, you were talking about the late diagnosis. I had a, a woman who was a mum from America on one of our discussions. And somebody said, well, surely you're anxious because of the kind of distress and stress of living with TSC. And she said, well, I don't agree, because I've had, I was diagnosed with TSC. Well, I, I had anxiety and anxiety issues all my life. And I was only diagnosed with TSC a year or two ago when my daughter was diagnosed. So I don't accept it because I never even knew that I had it. And again, we see that animals with TSC are more anxious than animals without TSC. So I think there is, again, there's something biological that drives an increased likelihood of anxiety um, and of depression in people with TSC. So we should look for it, we should treat it, and not think I have to soldier on and manage without any kind of support. And there are support things um, for people with TSC. ASD, we've already heard a bit about ASD, but these are the typical things on the checklist for autism spectrum disorder. Self-injury, very strongly links with autism here. Uh, language issues, repeating words and phrases, eye contact, getting on with other people, the social piece, repetitive things, very rigid or inflexibility. Any of those, and the more of them you have, the more likely you are to be at risk of an autism spectrum disorder. Um, and as I said, Age seven was the typical age that kids with TSC were diagnosed in our expert clinics, even though we know that half of them had a risk of having a diagnosis of ASD. So, so what we're really saying to people is, if your child has a risk of autism spectrum disorder, don't, be, don't fear looking for these things. And if we see social communication difficulties, if we see delays in onset of language, if we see very rigid behavior, Think about what that might be and think what we can do about it, rather than to hope that it's going to go away, because it tends not to. Many people, even if they don't meet criteria for autism, have significant social communication problems. Um, difficulty in social settings, difficulty making friends, difficulty particularly in new social situations, um, and it makes many people avoid those kind of situations. And so there are ways we can help people develop those kind of social skills, rather than for them to become impaired. Um, you heard a bit, bit from the NAS lady about support for school age kids and for adults. How much do you know about the very young kids with autism? 
What do you, who knows about these red <coughs> flags for ASD? Do you know the concept of the red flags for autism? <coughs> so these are, through many years of, of longitudinal research studies, people have identified that there are about 10 or 12 what we call red flags. So if you see any of these things in a young child, or at anybody at any age with, um, with any condition, it should make you think, might this be ASD? They're not diagnostic of ASD, but they're the things that should make you think, uh oh, I wonder if I should look about, look for it. I wonder if I should think about it. And, and let me show them to you. They're the things that typically developing kids do incredibly automatically from very early on. Here you can see. Not responding to your name by 12 months. It's so, it's so inbuilt that if I say, now they're all looking at me. I can't call your name. But it's, we're hardwired to turn and orient to somebody when they call our name. 12 months, if kids don't do it, it's a red flag. If they don't point at things to show interest by 40 months, think about little kids in their push chairs. I mean, look, I mean, look, look, look. Not to get things, but just to say, hey, did, that, did you see that? That's a red flag. Not doing pretend play by 18 months. So teacups and rocking the baby and pushing the car, those are red flags for autism. <laughs> Avoiding eye contact, wanting to be alone, that's a red flag that you will all know about. Not understanding other people's feelings or struggling to talk about their own is a red flag. Delayed speech and language, this used to be a diagnostic criteria, but it's not any longer. Um, but this is the main reason why mums take their children to doctors for query autism, because the child is two and they're not yet saying words, or they're three and they're not yet speaking in sentences. So that's a really important red flag. Um, repeating words and phrases, so echolalia saying the same thing. Sometimes people think their kids have lots of words, but it's actually a chunk from TV. Um, used appropriately, but if it's not spontaneous, then that's a red flag for autism. Giving answers unrelated to questions. Now, I say the medical students do the same, um, <laughs> but this is when you're trying to have a conversation and what comes back is really unrelated. I'll give you an example. Um, one of my team was talking, doing some sco social skills training with a child, 11-year-old. And she said to him, um, I love dogs, and I have a lovely Labrador at home. And he looked at her and he said to her, what color is your lawnmower? <laughs> <laughs> yeah? So you can see, completely unrelated to that. That's what we mean. Um, answers unrelated to questions. Getting upset by minor routines, and this can be minor, minor. It could be like where the salt and pepper is on the table, or having a shower before having breakfast, or having you know the bus coming 10 minutes early or 10 minutes early. Tiny things that can be major disruptions. Um, <coughs> very particular interest, being really in interested in spaceships, or rockets, or dinosaurs, or whatever it might be. Um, and interestingly, in girls, often these things are not so weird, but they might be you know, a particular pop star might be bunnies or animals, but still it's so intense and everything's about that particular thing. Um, the more physical things, hand flapping, um, twirling, tippy toeing, hopping, jumping, and then, and you've heard a lot about these unusual reactions to sound, smell, taste, or feel. Any of those are red flags for autism. And what we want to say to people is, if you have them, if you see them, don't panic and think it must be autism, but think we need to pursue the possibility because we know the earlier we can start, the more we can actually shape those developmental trajectories for kids. Um, and, and so this is my kind of fundamental question to you. Do you believe that we can treat autism? Can we change autism? Manage. Manage, okay. So manage is different from treat. Who thinks we can treat? Who thinks we can change the core deficits of autism? Who thinks we can work around the edges and make life better? Okay. So until probably a decade ago, we all believed that we can, we can accommodate, we can work around the deficits of autism, but we can't change the cause in itself. But there's now, particularly in the last 10, maybe 15 years, actually increasing evidence that if we use the right approaches and target social, the communication, the repetitive and stereotype, those kind of core deficits of autism, we can shape those and we can change the core profile of autism. 
and the, and the techniques that we use or the interventions that we're using these days are called, it's a big name, naturalistic developmental behavioral interventions. So they're not things that take a child for 40 hours into a therapy room with a specialist therapist, but they are, they are techniques that we use that brings, that we build into daily routines at home, going to school, being on the bus, washing clothes, um, and we help parents to incorporate those things into their daily routines. So we teach them turn taking, we teach them imitation, we teach them to follow the things that people are interested in. If you're interested in that cell phone, this fancy phone of yours, you're gonna do anything that relates to it, yeah? So, very simplistically, people with autism, or well, most of us are social learners. If I, if I don't know something, I'm going to come to some person who will help me understand something. Um, so if I see this thing and I don't know what it is, I'm going to bring it to you and go, what's that? And then you're going to teach me, right? If you have autism, you're much more likely to be an object-based learner. So you're going to take this thing and you're going to try and figure it out yourself and not share it or bring it to another person. So what we very simply teach mums and dads of autism is to put yourself between the child and the thing that they want. Hmm? So if, you, if, if you're the autistic child, and I've got your phone, and I wait a little bit, you're going to vocalize because you want this thing, and I'm going to use that to help you shape language, gestures, eye contact, etc. Not in a mean and nasty way, um, and we certainly don't want to do you know, nasty dog training, as people have done in the past, um, but the principles are there, and it can be incredibly powerful. But the earlier we start, the more likely we are to change things. We can always improve things. And even if you're 20 or 30 or 40 and you have ASD, we can use the same principles to help people develop communication, etc. One of the hardest things for mums and dads, because you know your son and daughter or family members so well, you anticipate absolutely everything. Hmm? You know what they want. When they go, ah, and it's 10 o'clock, you know that means it's tea time, right? And so the child goes, ah, and miraculously tea appears. Hmm? Isn't that awesome? So I've now learned all I need to do is go, ah, at 10, and tea appears. But that doesn't motivate me to communicate anything other than ah. Do you, do you see what I mean? And so what we're trying, one of the simple techniques that we're trying to build into these sorts of interventions is to help mums and dads just to pause, just to wait for a second and see if they get <coughs> eye contact, and see if you get more than a vocalization. And then my, something that's like tea, then you're gonna say you want tea, and then you give it to the child. So that's a way to, in a very natural way, to teach them what it means, these words that come out of our mouths, why they give us the things that we need. Can you see it sounds a bit odd, but the, the principle is super simple, and there are some very good interventions. And in fact, we can give you, there's a very nice um, intervention called the Early Start Denver Model, ESDM. And there's a parent book you could buy on Amazon, um, and it teaches you many of these very simple principles. Um, and so those are the principles that we're trying to think, how can we bring it to people in an easy and accessible way around the world? And I think for us in the TSC community, it could be just as valuable as people in the autism community outside TSC. But even adults with autism can learn many of these skills. We should, the first thing for us is to believe that they can learn to speak and, that, and to believe that they can change some of these core inflexible and, um, and repetitive behaviors. Um, and then we see that 90% of people with autism learn to speak. Um, and along that, all their learning improves and their intellectual and development improves as well. Um, so two words before we wrap up about ongoing and future research. So clearly, with this whole story about mTOR inhibitors to treat TAN, I think is something that over the next few years we will continue with and try to find funding to continue asking those questions. Um, we also know very little about other drug treatments for TAN. Um, you can hear, I, a lot of what I talk about are, are behavioral social talking interventions rather than medication interventions, because we know very little, there's very little evidence for any of those interventions um, in, in TAN. But also, I think there are lots and lots of incredibly valuable interventions that we want to see how well we can use them in people with TSC that are non-drug related as well. Um, I mentioned to you the TAN toolkit, which we want to get to, um, if we get money. 
And then this is a question that many people are asking, how early can we start? As you know, in kidneys and brain lesions, some people are saying, can we start at birth? And then people are saying, oh, if I see a rhabdo on a fetal ultrasound, can I start in utero? Um, so the, the kind of fundamental question is, how early can we start treating TSC? And then the balance would be, well, how early would it be appropriate to start? Do we start before epilepsy comes online? Because that will prevent epilepsy? Well, the evidence at the moment is not clear. Um, so, but, th but that's where the field is at. That's really where we are in terms of thinking um, in treatment options for people with TSC. Some of them are about broader than TAN, but certainly these are all for in the TAN sphere um, as well. Um, and then, of course, the big question, and many people, and, and you know the Americans are particularly keen on curing things. Um, can we cure TSC? So what do you think about that? Can we cure TSC? Should we cure TSC? You think it is? Yeah. Do you mean in terms of? What's your definition of cure? Switching that gene off. Yeah, switching off gene. Yeah, that'll prevent it from causing any of those adverse effects. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Any other thoughts about cure? I guess my response is, it depends what we mean by cure. Um, I think if, we, if by cure we mean eradicating something, or you know, making people disappear who have a condition, that's why it's such an issue in the autism community, curing autism. Um, because as we heard, people bring unique characteristics. If by cure we mean really optimizing outcomes and possibilities, um, then I'm, I'm all for curing. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to illustrate this for you with a, with a photograph. So, as you can see here, on the one side is me. Next to me is my brother. This is Friedel. He's 38 now. And as you can tell, he has Down syndrome, and he has autism, and he has intellectual disability. And he, you can see he looks very happy. He is an expert in opera and rugby. I think it's an unusual combination, but those are his areas of expertise. And we had incredible challenges with him when he was young, and it was very hard. He had significant dysregulated behavior, significant um, problems and issues. But he has an incredibly good quality of life now, and he's still learning. And that iPad that he's holding in his hand really opened up the world for him. So he has a rich quality of life, he has learned, he continues to learn. And I think sometimes when we think about disabilities, we focus so much on the challenges that come with disability. But when we ask most people who live with disabilities to rank positives and negatives about living with disability, almost always people list more positives about living with disability than they list negatives about living with disability. Because it enriches our lives. It makes us think about the world in ways that we haven't thought about it in other ways. So I think my answer about curing is if we want to optimize his life, sure. If we want to make him disappear, I wouldn't support it. Um, and I think it's just a, a, a good thought um, for all of us. And let me, let me wrap up there for So I think switching to positives and not just the deficits that we might see in TSE, it's really important to help ourselves find the personal pleasures. What are the things we enjoy doing together? What are the things that we enjoy doing on our own. The shared pleasures with family members. Sometimes we just concentrate on daily care. And we don't think about just having fun. What's the thing that you and I can do together that we love doing? Because these are the things that life is about. Um, find out what motivates your family member, the person with TSC. We're all motivated by things. If we can find those things, we can shift mountains with motivation. Um, and I think that's a really, really important thing for us to to bear in mind, and then maybe just to end, and I know we're going to have another talk um, in a second, but coming back to Lauren and her very, very untimely death, I think it just brings back to us the message that life is precious and life is short, and we should do the things that are important to us and not waste time with things that are not so important to us. And so that's my wish for all of you. Find those pleasures, enjoy the pleasures, um, and don't waste time to do exactly that.